Hello, my antique loving friends. It's Gregory here with Old Europe Antique Home Furnishings. It's August 6, 2023, and welcome to another episode of Antique Acquisitions. Today, I want to talk to you all about two different things. The first is transferware, some of which you can see in the cabinet behind me. And also, I want to talk about that Dutch cabinet that houses the transferware. So let's get to it. start off by a brief discussion of this beautiful Dutch cabinet. Now this is a late 18th, early 19th century Dutch cabinet. You can see it sports the ball and claw feet on cabriole legs. Now a lot of people do attribute that design or motif to Thomas Chippendale in the 18th century. However, it did not, in fact, come from Mr. Chippendale. It was inspired by uh, Chinese designs or Asian designs. Now, as you can see, this piece is veneered in mahogany. Mahogany was not native to Europe, so this would have been imported. And the Dutch were among the first to begin using veneers instead of carved oak furniture. And one thing that the Dutch are known for is their parquetry and marquetry. This would be an example of parquetry here. It's a design that's laid into the mahogany veneer. And what else do I want to tell you about this cabinet? Let's, let's open up this drawer. Now, there's a, unique, a couple of unique things about this cabinet. This, as you'll notice, they don't have the dovetails. In fact, it's just a little uh, groove here for the drawer to slide along. Now, that was typical in the 17th century and before. The dovetail actually started to become widely in use in Europe in the, I believe it was the 17th century. So, that's interesting. The other thing I want to point out about this cabinet is the use of pegs in its construction. In fact, I forgot to point that out. You can see what one of these pegs looks like right there. It's got a screw in it, had to remove it. But there are numerous places in this cabinet that they use these pegs to hold it together. In fact, those are both holes there that are made for pegs to hold the cabinet together. It's really kind of an ingenious design. Now, this cabinet is decked out with this beautiful yellow moire fabric in silk. And that's a really nice touch. Before we talk about the transfer wear, let me just go back around here. And I'll show you the back. Here's another one of those holes uh, for a peg. Someone was kind enough to carve top into the back panel so we know what goes where. And now let's talk about the transfer wear. Transfer wear originated in England in the seven, uh, 18th century, about 1750. Originally, it would have been made with a uh, pattern that was drawn on to some type of paper, I believe, and then transferred, laid onto a blank white ceramic dish, and then, of course, refired after that by the early 19th century. And then, particularly after the Industrial Revolution, you started to see mass production of this transferware to accommodate the ever growing middle class, which resulted. From the economic boom of the Industrial Revolution. 
just trying to get some up close pictures. I think what I'll do is uh, take a minute to read a few details. Okay, here we go with a little bit more information. Transferware is a kind of pottery made by transferring a customized print from special paper onto earthenware or a porcelain dish. Depending on its age and condition, a piece of transferware can be incredibly valuable. This 200-year-old art form continues to grow in popularity even today. Transferware is a style of pottery characterized by intricate patterns and images transferred onto dishes, hence the name transferware. These artistic dishes often depicted images of young lovers, heroic figures, the countryside, floral designs, and other nostalgic pleasant scenes. Generally, the transferware can be identified simply by the color and characteristics of its feature design. These dishes are typically white, providing a clear background for the details of the image. The ink most commonly used to transfer patterns is a dark blue color, though other colors were certainly used at the peak period of production. Transferware pieces can be found in red, pink, purple, cranberry, brown, black, green, yellow, gray, or even a combination of colors and those may be more valuable than the blue based on rarity. The transferware technique originated in England around the 1750s and was an adaption inspired by Chinese hand-painted porcelain. At first, European potters imitated the patterns, styles, and motifs of the Chinese. As transferware grew in popularity, the patterns that distinguished it became more anglicized. Thousands of individual patterns were created and tens of millions of pieces were produced. Demand for transferware increased as the English middle class began to boom, accounting for the contemporary ubiquity of these beloved dishes in the mass market. European potters often strove to imitate the blue and white hand-painted porcelain of the Chinese, adapting the designs to reflect Western culture. Rising to meet the demand for more affordable tableware, the new resources and machinery of the Industrial Revolution enabled artists and potters to commoditize items like transferware. With an etched master plate from which to copy hundreds of images, the production process took less time than ever before, thereby lowering the price for middle to lower class customers. Because transferware was significantly easier to produce than hand-painted china, members of the upper class began to view it as utilitarian and therefore less valuable. During the peak of transferware production, approximately 90% of the dishes were made in and sold from Staffordshire, Leeds, Liverpool, Swansea, and Scotland. But by 1820, the English had established such an international affinity for transferware that even after the War of 1812, artists succeeded at attracting American customers with dishes featuring American landscapes, buildings, war heroes, and patterns. And I want to add that recently I saw an orange set of transferware and it was made depicting images from the University of Texas at Austin and orange is the university color so this practice continues on to this day. Transferware is renowned for its one-of-a-kind detailed designs an artistic uniqueness which with the exception of hand-painted works was difficult to accomplish. To achieve such a high level of intricacy and precision Artists first etch the pattern onto either a copper or a steel plate, a process that can take up to a month per picture. The copper plate is then covered in ink and scraped horizontally, evening out the amount of color prior to application. Immediately pressing a piece of tissue paper onto the engraved plate, the potter then transfers the inked image onto the surface of a piece of porcelain. The newly patterned dish is then placed in a kiln enabling the ink to adhere and a final glaze to set. Earthenware is the most common base for transfer patterns, followed by ironstone, porcelain, and bone china. Transferware is still made today, using modern methods that move beyond the older, more labor-intensive strategies. Because of the time and skill required to produce them, antique pieces of transferware are valuable items at any antique store or pawn shop. If the piece is old or hand-painted, it has a higher chance of being valuable. Hand-painted pieces can be identified simply through close inspection. If the transfer shows a stippling texture, which is a pattern of raised dots, rather than brush strokes, it was most likely hand-painted. This painting technique is intended to have a tonal effect 
on the porcelain and indicates a significant amount of time and artistic skill. Another factor in determining the value of transferware is rarity. Some colors, like yellow and red, are more rare than blue and therefore often sell for a higher price. Though blue was the original color of ink used in the art of transferware production, other colors began to appear with frequency around the same time throughout the mid-1800s. The general appearance of the pattern of the pottery can be a helpful indicator in determining the age of the item. Most of these dates are approximate, but the closer to early 19th century British manufacturing, the better. Using the details of the pattern for reference, appraisers can trace the pottery to certain manufacturer's books, registry marks, invoices, and even documented items of correspondence. Many historical reference books contain all of this information and more. Not every potter engaged in this practice, but in the areas where it was a common step in the production process, impress dating is invaluable. Originally, the purpose of impressing a date on each piece was not for historical context, but the practicality of manufacturing. In other words, these dates helped store owners assess older material compared to newer, newer material or inventory, keeping their wares up to date and in line with rapidly advancing trends. Here are some examples of how impress dates functioned. The date was indicated by a unique format. Months by the corresponding number 1 through 12, and years by the last two digits, with the implication that it was the 19th century. So if it said 5 equal 42, then that would be May 1842. An equal sign was often used in between the month and the year. Other date forms used the first letter of the month to indicate the month instead of a number. Another indication of older transfer wear is the tone of the piece itself behind the transferred print. The darker the tone, the more likely it is that the piece is vintage and teak transfer wear with a warm body tone rather than the white tone of newer pieces will also feel lighter in your hand and more delicate. That's not exactly intuitive, but the older pieces are in fact less heavy. Newer pieces tend to weigh more than old ones. The rarest china is English made, tracing back to 1780 to 1820. Now that's pre-industrial. All right, folks. Well, that's going to wrap it up for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. And please do take a second to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel so that you'll be advised of more episodes when they become available. I hope you all have a great day, and we'll see you next time.